Um, thanks for having me come. I'm so glad I could fill in for Mark. Um, thanks called me and and I was going to do custom fitting glass eyes, but apparently somebody else has done that. So we're going to do the old squad that I did last year. Um, and uh, the reason I'm going to show you this video is, is this is kind of what inspired this piece. Um, you know, you can look at a lot of photos of birds and old squaws. You usually see them in the water, um, being a sea duck and always away up north. Maybe you'll see them on some ice, but pretty much you're always going to see them mostly in the water. And I noticed in this, this is a, a zoo kept old squaw. There's a lula. You know what the alula is that comes with the, what's a called, called the bastard thumb in Latin. Um, it's an undeveloped thumb, um, part of the wing that all birds have. And you can see it just under the water right here. But I'd never seen that before. <clears throat> and so, so uh, when I saw that, I thought, wow, you know, I've never seen that before. What the heck is going on there? And they, they use it partially for steerage, you know, steering. And I thought, well, is kind of naively thought, is this because it's a zoo cat bird? Do they clip the wings or do something strange that I'm unaware of? I'm going to make a fool of myself if I carve this in, you know. So I went on YouTube and I got this video, and if you look at these birds, all of them, they flick out those alula just before they dive, every single time. And so I did it in slow motion just to make sure that that's what I was really seeing, and I thought, okay, I'd never seen anyone carve that before, so I decided I was going to incorporate it into to my next piece, which is what you're seeing there um, coming off of those wings. Um, I like to carve out of a single piece of wood, as a lot of you already know. Um, so one of the biggest challenges for me was going to be able to carve this bird um, with the tail. Um, curving back it, as if it's in the, the winds of the northern seas when it's up on the water. So, you, you know, that tail is truly straight, but the wind will catch it. And there's all kinds of movement going on, in my opinion, in this piece, and that's what I was after. So I was fascinated with this video, and uh, Tom Huntington from Wildfowl Carving Magazine had said that they didn't have any no pieces on old squaws and asked me if I would do an old squaw, so I did. Uh, I'm going to pause this now and just move Good on. Research. So yeah, you know, what you can do, I had to import this video, I had to figure out a way to download it from YouTube import it into Movie Maker and then slow it down to 1.5 speed so that I could actually really see what was going on and it's worked out well as a uh, uh, demonstration piece. Oops, <laughs> didn't mean to do that, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry you guys, I did not mean to close that. I promise. <laughs> I left those at home. <laughs> All right, here we go. Sorry. Okay. So I always start out with a clay model, and um, sometimes I use an armature. Sometimes I, for on the body, like styrofoam, so that I don't have to use so much clay. Um, and then I also use a study bill uh, to uh, for the head because it's so much easier to form uh, the clay around that, and the clay just won't hold the detail of a of a of a bill. So. I use the study bill for that. I'm going to have to go a little bit faster than I like through this just because this was a two hour presentation at World. But it just kind of shows you, you know, I built, you can build up, this is way thicker than obviously it would end up in the end. 
but as carvers we're really good at removing wood but with the clay um, I can start out fat and then come back with my tools and carve it away down to what I like it to be in the end. So these are just some preliminary views of um, the clay model. I used tag board for the, the main part of the tail as armature and um, <laughs> I, I was considering having it touch the head and decided that was a little too much. Um, then I also insert the glass eyes and I made some uh, templates out of, for the primaries and the rest of the tail. Um, I was trying to get that curve and it wouldn't stay where I wanted it to so I left it long. Once I got my preliminary um, clay model done, I use this tool. I have two different sizes uh, that allows me to snug right up to the outer edge of the, of the clay model and I put a pencil in and mark that outer edge so that I have a, a exact copy of the above view of my clay model. I make little dots all the way around it and then I connect them and this is giving me my top view of my bird perfectly. Um, it's kind of blocked with this and I don't know how to get rid of that. Maybe I can get into a uh, screen here. There we go. So I like to work on a um, Lazy Susan. I have a few different sizes. Um, once I get my pattern all outlined, I'll uh, fold it in half for my center line and then I kind of check to see how even I was on that clay model because you know it looks pretty good but you know really in real life a bird is not as symmetrical as um, a lot of people make them uh, adding some uh, differences and things can make it look more real so you can see I've got my clay model and um, markings and I've cut I drawn the center line but you can see how it was a little bit different on one side to the other so I straighten that out get rid of my line and, and I find when I'm drawing a pattern if if I've got a line that's wrong it's better to leave the line that's wrong draw the line that's right and then re erase that um, wrong line because uh, a lot of times it took a lot of time to get to that wrong line in, in measurements and sketching out so it just saves time to just put the line in correctly and then uh, remove the wrong ones. So I go through and I finalize, I do all my measurements and uh, start measuring like you know where does the cape end and uh, once I get some of these major reference points laid in, I started drawing the head. That was the hardest part to draw because, you know, I'm drawing from above and um, it, to make it look right in a pattern was, was actually very difficult. Um, so once I got one side that I liked drawn correctly, I folded, folded in half and then I'm able to, to trace the opposite side on my light box, I have a stand-up light box at home that I use. Then I can get my top view of the head um, drawn in. So I'm sitting pretty good here, but now I've got to get those Alula. Just keep developing this pattern. I'm, like I said, I'm going to quickly go through this because we have a lot more in the carving and painting to go can see where you know you start laying in your feather patterns and your feather tracks and um, your pencil is your, your greatest tool because it can make or break your piece you have the ability to make all these changes here just like you had the abilities to make the ability to make all those changes in your clay model um, work out questions you have before you actually start carving uh, cutting on a bandsaw so pattern development looks really messy while you're doing it over and over and over again. And uh, you know, here's one of those pictures that's from that video. I took a screenshot and printed that out so I'd have that reference. 
I didn't want to put them out quite as far as the picture because I really felt, felt like I was pushing the envelope on this whole thing. And I was so happy that Tom Huntington trusted me. I mean, he already slated the book, or the, the article, not knowing if I was going to succeed in this. <laughs> Even I got the carving done, well, would I ever be able to paint it? Yeah, well, that was, I couldn't believe I did it. <laughs> and he trusted me. So I use this triangle here in this graph paper because I can now line up my top view with what's going to eventually be my side view. So right now I'm drawing the line all the way down here so that I can line the breast of the side view up with that and know that I'm exactly equal. I also need to take measurements for the height of the uh, clay model to transfer onto this profile view that I'm drawing now. So I use this, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. I wandered up and down the hardware aisle looking for something to do the trick and this one carpenter stuck out what just a carpenter square okay carpenter square but the the level really helped me to see that i was actually holding it correctly to get the right measurement and it gave me the measurements so um i go through and i start to uh draw what i can see lining with my ruler you know how high does that bill have to be while it comes comes right up to here and if you line all of these things up in the end you'll see the ruler will line it up so this carpenter square really is helpful for getting these measurements transferred onto the side view with the tail um, the pin tails of the or the pin feathers of the tail that was um, something I just drew in uh, kind of freehand once I got things laid in. In the pattern in the book, in the magazine, I, what I do is I draw the, the group outlines on one side and then the detailed feather patterns on the other so that you can see it broken down because a lot of times all of these lines of the feathers will detract from the group lines and can very, be very confusing. Um, so this is how I developed my, my, what I did was I printed out the pattern. I had to print out a tail and kind of put them together and then I glued them onto tag board and then I cut out these tag board templates. I used that spray on adhesive glue that gave me nice thick. I didn't have to, to draw onto the templates with carbon paper like I've done in the past. This is kind of a new thing that I've been doing. Um, makes things a lot faster. When I uh, get my big pieces of Tupelo, they're not always square. And I need to uh, make sure that the end is square and I use uh, the triangles to do that. But I also have to trim off uh, a bit of the end because it can check. So here I am sitting in the garage getting ready to bandsaw this out. So I cut off the one end. I can see I've got all clear wood. There's one little hard spot right here, but other than that is a beautiful piece of Tupelo. And uh, this is my line for cutting off. Of course, when you cut this line, you pray there isn't a check from the other end. You didn't know about. Is the center of the tree in that piece? No. No. No, the heart of the wood is right beyond here, okay. but the rings are still like this. So okay. there's, there's no real heart, but I did do it like this. This is how the green circles would be. So this is what get this was the what was left over, and I cut it this way on purpose because I still felt like I could get something out of this piece of wood one day. And uh, so once I got I got my block, I come in and I have to draw all my pattern um, template outlines on, and I choose the best side to do that with and. It ended up the feather side wasn't showing, but it doesn't matter because really all that's important at this point is the outlines. 
and I want I have this line drawn here so that I can make sure that the breast lines both here are matching up <coughs> and you can see the distance between here and here is also the same so I'm sitting nice and straight so when I cut out a one piece bird out of Tupelo uh, I start on the one end and I bring it up to a certain point and then I back out and I come back and do the same thing from the front and then I back it out and I leave these little tabs here um, you'll see so that the sides don't fall away when I'm done cutting the above view um, you can see I've done I've come in on both sides here and I'm doing the front now and I'll leave the tab about here then when, once I, I get my, um, those tabs in the above you cut, I can cut the profile very easily. Now this looks pretty messy, but um, this is what I'm gonna knock off because I didn't want to chance anything breaking off because um, I was whacking it or prying it. And so I kind of stopped at this point. <clears throat> Most often it just falls away and I had to do a little bit of carving here to get rid of all of this excess of side wood. So in the end, this is what I've done. This is, if I could have had all of those pieces fall away at once, I would have walked away from my bandsaw like this. <laughs> so once I get that done, um, you have to consider a lot of things when you're carving a single piece bird like this and what and where the stress points are and what I'm going to have to be careful for. If this is going to be a long project it's going to have pressure applied to the alula. It's going to have the bill sticking straight up. And then it's also that tail is, is of concern. So these are areas that I left um, thick and bulky um, until the very end. I placed my template on my uh, bandsaw blanks and used these wig pins to um, mark where that center line is supposed to be. You can see I've done that and then I can lay it right on the bird. This is the bill um, of the head that I'm thinning out. That's the widest point of the entire bill is no, no wider than this. So I can remove everything right here and know that I still have enough wood for the bill. The tail, uh, I left really wide for quite some time, but uh, I did take off a good portion of it. I use the carbide cuts all. Um, it's the, I think it's not the coarsest like you were talking about, um, the one just down from that. Um, and this is the three quarter inch by three inch cylinder. It lets me cut at right angles so that I can um, keep my, uh, keep, stay true to my pattern. Now this here, I'm not gonna cut out for a really long time. That's the support I need for that tail until I get the rest of the bird carved. Again, I use my wig pins to kind of lay out these, these uh, feather groups. And I'm not gonna be carving the individual feathers, but I am going to be defining the individual groups. And in the scapular groups, it's different than on, you know, say a redhead. They all, all the scapulars kind of just come to a round back end, but in the old squaw, it's got all these long scapular feathers, so that's why it's um, important for me to go and lay these all out like I have here. Through drawing in the side view, cutting in the underside of that uh, alula, it's going to be a lot more cut under, but for now, we're just getting that. I'm just getting the Alula defined. Wish I could get rid of that when it's blocking. Then I wasn't really sure, for sure, how I was going to handle these primary tips, and I ended up tucking them under the tail. Um, I was pretty happy I did that because there were so many other things that were going to be broken if I wasn't careful. Uh, again, this is the top view of the head. I've drawn those lines in before, and now I'm going to come in and cut those out. 
uh, I take I like to take these at right angles as far as I can just to stay true to my pattern but at a, after a certain point you have to start rounding things out so I decided to start rounding um, the chest and the wings first uh, top of the wings uh, my pattern told me I could cut straight down to this line and straight in, but I didn't trust my pattern. And so I just, I, I just felt like I needed to take a bunch of wood off before I actually did that. And then once I did, I could see it was going to be safe for me to go straight in and, and from the side and straight down. And, um, and if you can do that, you're saving a whole bunch of time and a bunch of wood goes fast. So it's nice if you can trust your pattern. Um, I love these carbide cuts all, I mean these carbide um, cross cutters. They, when I'm coming off of um, the carbide cuts all, you know the surface of that wood has been torn and it's just below the surface is, is fuzzy and this cuts right through that and cleans up that bandsaw or surface or that um, roughed out surface left from your cuts all and it leaves a nice clean um, surface so that I can I don't have to sand it I can just um, start drawing so I've here I've started drawing in my wing um, groups the greater wing coverts and all and then we've got the little rump that's going underneath um, you can see that it gets rounded I'm rounding all of these you guys, if anyone ever has a question, feel free to stop me because I, I know I'm cruising kind of fast. Here I'm cutting in the lower mandible and, and the V just below um, that meets the point of the lower mandible. You can see I've brought the face all the way in to the widest point of the upper mandible. I'm going to leave it open just a little bit as if it's calling or having um, again I start going at right angles when I'm cutting um, the bill details in because it, it, I know where I'm going I can go in so far and goes down so deep and cutting at right angles until I get that right then I can round it off now I'm done the same thing here and I'm gonna take this high point and round it and remove all the excess of wood more sketching. You can see how I've got the wing flowing right up and underneath those scapulars. It's important to have that wing flow occur underneath. It's also important to take measurements as you go. What well, was one of the hardest things that I had to do is teach myself to stop and take my measurements because I'd be carving for an hour and I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't taken any measurements for a really long time. And it's more necessary when you're newer to carving or you're carving a bird that you're not familiar with. But, um, and I would find myself just catching myself just in time, you know, when I could have really gone wrong. So teaching yourself to stop. Now see how much excess of wood there is on these Alula. They were huge, but again, they were getting whacked on the side of the table and and I wanted to keep them safe. A little bit of the bill detail being drawn in. I use a 16th inch um, shaft uh, diamond flame to carve my bill detail in because it's nice and small and get a lot of control out of it. I think you guys have seen how I set eyes and um, slide the eyes up and into the head and, and then drop them down so I don't have to use wood fill. Well, how do you hold them in then? The wood holds them in. Um, what I'll do is when I'm ready to permanently set these, yeah. I'll take the eye out and I will put a little bit of wood fill in behind this bulk and then as I put the eye in, it squishes out maybe excess, but it fills in that that hole behind the eye and there's no way that eye is ever going to tilt back and it's stuck in forever so. What color is that eye? Yellow? It's kind of a peachy, orangey, peachy orange, you know. Um, 
the little X's show where I was going to have to remove that. This is the tip of the primaries and the ed outside edge of the tail. I cut them in right there now and I was able to now cut in the X the side view of the tail. Can I ask you something? Sure. I ordered some rice on the guy after you the company down in Florida mm -hmm. and I wanted yellow for my bird. And he said, well, I don't want yellow, but I got these, these called the windy show. Orangey one. yellow? Yeah. yeah. And they came in that, I couldn't use it for a bird. They were really right. too orange or too red? Yeah, bad? I think it was the, I, and then I asked myself, what do they use these for? I wonder if that's the kind of ducting. It, it might have been, you know, I find that, um, Unless you know exactly what I you're ordering, say from Tohican, they're very consistent at Tohican. But unless you, I, I go to the world and I handpick my eyes. And I want to know, I want them to match. I'll buy four pair to make sure I got at least three that match. So, you know, um, but there are guides like say if you go to Tohican Glass Eyes, they, but it's it's like generic colors. It's not really what you're going to get. So that's why hand picking has always been preferential to me. Uh, I've cut in this, the tail. I'm right here. I'm just taking off that hard line and rounding up to the underside of the tail. And things are starting to take shape. Um, I had to stay outside in my garage um, workbench because this dust collector uh, is taller and that tail was always banging, would have always been banging on my Tornado 1000. Um, so I stayed in my garage the whole time carving on this, but this is gonna be the most feather um, definition that there'll be, getting pretty close to, you know, even though I wasn't gonna carve the feathers in, it's, it's good to work out way, the way I'm going to paint them because, um, you know, you can't paint out uh, a thick feather, you can't paint it thinner, so you want to make sure you, you get things um, carved down to the what you want. One of the last things I do is the eyes. You can see I put that wood fill is in there behind the eye and it squished out a little bit, so now I'm coming and cleaning that up. Taking off the bulk on the neck getting pretty close here on the body and the head, but now I've got to start dealing with the tail. And that was quite the challenge. In fact, it took me three days because I could only do so much. <laughs> I got just the stress of it all. <laughs> and so I, I would work and I had to counter pressure the tail against my chest because I was pushing on it and carving and I just, Okay, that's enough for today. I'm going to come back tomorrow, <laughs> and, and I did it at you know maybe three sittings at about two hours total, but it was very scary. <laughs> it ended up being stronger than I thought it would be, though. It's taken a few bumps and done well. Um, when I do my decorative smoothies, I want to sand it really soft and really smooth so that the the actual feather here. <coughs> This is going to tell me where my feather paint line has to stop. It's going to dictate that. So if I want to have some freedom in like adding a split or feathering things off, it's important to sand it nice and smooth so that, and then maybe pencil that line in so that you can see um, where you could go with your paint. That should show through on the, um, through the sealer when it's done being sealed. Um, now it's time to carve that tail. I carved it thin, narrowed it first. And I, it was a process of, you know, the first day I did the under the tail part, and, or the top of the tail part, I should say. The second day I narrowed, this is day two, and then I sanded for another day, um, finishing that up. So pretty much we're at the point where I've sealed it now and um, when I seal with deft I also come back with steel wool and make sure I'm not finding any drips or anomalies that I didn't know about even thumbprints or fingerprints you'll see in there and they'll show through that <laughs> really drives you nuts when you're painting a smoothie so I use this brush to get rid of all of that excess excessive dust from the deft 
Um, I like to paint on a white surface. I keep my paints all in front of me like this in <laughs> color wheel. Uh, it's just the way I like to do things. I know where everything is. I don't even have to look. So um, I start out with a Liquitex black gesso. Not always, but in this particular project, um, it was what I chose to use. Um, and my undercut coats, my base coats, for the whites were really, really yellow, as you can see, and I did that on purpose. That was, I wanted this, if you look in an old spa, if you look deep into those feathers, below the outer edges, they've got kind of this yellow glow about them, and I wanted that to be in there and deep, so that's why I painted um, this yellow first, because it would show through eventually. So this is basically all my base co coats have been applied. Then I start drawing in my feather pattern. And I find drawing in these feather patterns with, I use the, the deco art paint because you can see where, say I've over drawn on one of these feathers and into another and uh, I don't really like that. Well, which is it? Is it this feather's going to meet up to there, or is it this feather's going to meet up to there? Well, with the deco art paint, uh, I can come back with a, br a wet brush and just damp and remove and thin down each one of these scallops to be the shape and thickness that I'd like it to be. So we'll get back to that one, I'm sure. Here I'm doing the same thing with the contrasting color. On the whites, I used a, a dark gray. It looks black, but it's a dark gray. And on the lights, I used the same dark gray. It doesn't look like it's dark gray. It looks like it's white when it's on these darker colors, but it's actually the same color. So once I got all my feathers painted in, or laid in, I move on to the tail. Tail feathers are really hard to get straight. I don't know why. I kept having seven on one side and eight on the other. <laughs> and I was just like, what? Anyway, so as you can see, I've done contrasting strokes, very thin paint, and um, this is what's. These are my guides for when I'm going to do all the individual feather strokes. If I'm running out of time, let me know. Um, I also lay in the quills um, because that's going to tell me where the barbs are going to come off of the quill and, and give the contour to each one of these feathers. Now you can see each in the same contrasting color. I call these these are what I call highlights on a dark feather and on a light feather I call them low lights or shadow and if when you're painting dark feathers you can't paint black on black I mean it's going to be black when you look at it from afar but when you're looking at it um, closely uh, you still want to be able to see all those individual feather barbs but if you're painting black on black, they're not going to show. So you have to have something in contrast so that these colors, or so that the dark feather will show. So these are kind of an undercoat of highlight is what I guess I'd call that. I do that with all of my dark feathers, same contrasting. And I'm not really, I mean, look at how messy I am on these quills. It's nothing to get balled up about because you're still going to be coming back a million times and painting it over and over again. These are uh, really nice majestic um, micro brushes that uh, are cheap and they have a really fine point and work really great with acrylics. I mentioned them in my article. You see, I come back and I'm doing all the individual feather strokes for each one of the individual feathers on the face. You can see the long ones I put on the head, the uh, top head feathers. Starting to do the scapular feathers. And again, we've got the contrast here because that quill is going to be white. But by putting this dark 
in the center of this quill. When I paint that white, that quill's gonna pop out and it's gonna have shadow on every side, on both sides. And it, it'll be the same thing with every single one of these quills. When you do it in contrast, and you come back with the real color, it has something, it offers something in contrast to actually let it show. So now I come back with about four other colors and do the same feather strokes all over the entire head. And I end up doing, I come back faster. I've done with, uh, I've done all these little individual feather barbs, but I can come back with an entire brush stroke and start at the base of that feather and pull it back and lift it up as it's, I start at the end of the feather and lift it up as I come to the base so that I'm leaving that yellow in the depth of the feather. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Did you just pick up a paintbrush and start painting or did you take some classes or go to school somewhere? Or? No, this is just how I figured yeah. out it works for cool. me. Cool. <laughs> it, you know, was, this was the hardest article I've ever written was defining how I paint and because and, I didn't know, I just did it. And then, okay, well now you have to explain it you know, dissecting what I do so that somebody else can understand it and maybe try it is... Did you paint a lot as a kid growing up and art or something like that? Or? I, I was always artistic, yes. Yes. That answers that. <laughs> okay. My mom's an artist. Okay. okay. I, from the age of, in fifth grade, they asked me, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I said I was going to be an artist. I just always knew I would be. So, here we've got the contrasting color and I can start coming in and look, I mean already look how feathery that starts to look with just simple strokes. Um, of course it took very many simple strokes. I can see I've come back with the quill and see how the quill isn't perfect but the fact that I had the black underneath of it just really makes the rest of the quill pop on either side and it just provides a shadow for it. It's the same thing with um, all of the feathers. They're all just, I come back with a, a brush here and soften off the shadows that I've been adding slowly, 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 just building it up. Then I came back and you can see on the top here I'm coming back and I'm tinting all of these light contrasting colors to bring these feathers down to the right color that they're supposed to be. This is a wash that I did over the, the breast, dark breast feathers. I'd come back with contrasting gray, feathered it in, and every time I come back, this outer edge, that first scallop that looks so hard, keeps diminishing more and more. And you, in the end, you don't really see it. It's starting to lose that. You see on this side, I have added the dark. This side, I haven't. So see how those, these lines are now disappearing. But they were my guide, and they're also serving as a highlight to show the back edge of that feather. This is a tail. It's kind of hard to tell, but... Uh, There's some transition colors that happen here that I wanted to soften this dark to light, so I came in with some medium color of rust. You can see I feathered out all of these. I'll be coming back and doing those quills too. Side pockets. I'm gonna do the bill. It looks really orange here, but it's not. You can see that on the real duck and come back with some light pink and change that. But then I also started coming in and individually feathering each one of these on the breast to, so that I could ditch these guidelines. Did the individual lamellae on the teeth there, on the bill there. Um, painting the tail. <laughs> The underside of this bird, I had to be really creative, so I've got some sandbags, a downfield pillowcase, uh, pillow with a 
a soft pillowcase and then I used a paper towel roll to support so that I could actually paint this bird hands free. I started trying like this, it was exhausting, so um, this is my solution. And you can see how, how messy it looks in the very beginning. I mean, it's kind of like the dorky state when you're roughing out a bird, it looks all kind of chunky and square. Well, this is the dorky state of painting. Um, with each step you take, it just it starts cleaning up further and further until you have nice soft transitions. And that's it. How long did this take you from the start to the finish? Um, think about this for a second. It took me six months. Six. Yeah. And, but, you know, when you're photographing everything you do, this is what you saw is only a tenth of the photographs. These are the best of the photographs, or the ones that explain best what I was trying to sh portray. And you know, training yourself to stop and take the photo, and then um, you, you just—it's something you know that's very difficult to. I have a camera that is one-handed, so that I can just pick it up, take the picture, put it back down, pick it up, take the picture, put it back down, and. And I learned to frame every shot so that I don't have to come back and crop every single one to make it work and show what I want. So, you know, it, it is a training. And, and when you're writing an article or a book, like the Loon book that I'm just finishing up now, it took me nine months to carve the Loon, but it's taking another three months to finish up the, you know, he talked to me about it a year ago. And, right away so we're just doing the final um, steps on editing kind of exciting <laughs> any other questions they hunt the old squirrel on the coast don't they pardon me they, they hunt them don't they they do but they hunt them up north like in the northern tundra mm -hmm. they go deep or not I don't know. Well, Probably I don't know. not. I think they eat a lot of fish. Probably like fish. Shellfish, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they eat mus mussels and crustaceans. Yeah, they crunch them. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 They are Royal Majestic, and if you go to artistspaintbrush.com, they sell them, like, you buy them, buy them for a dollar, fifty. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're cheap. Mm -hmm. Artistspaintbrush.com. Mm -hmm. The sides that um, from the bandsaw, they had they had the same shape and the same wood and everything, and I dipped it in there, and and I didn't see that it made it actually kind of like if you use super glue, it can make things a little bit stiffer and snap faster than because with Tupelo, 
You got a little bit of flex, so. Thank you.